problem. No problem. Really great to see everybody. Thanks, Jesper. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, or whatever part of the day it might happen to be in whatever bits of the world you were in. Um, I'm here in Sydney on the East Coast uh, on Gadigal land at the, of the people of the Aora Nation, and we pay respects uh, to their elders past and present and rising. Not very far from the beach, um, which is lovely, although not a particularly brilliant day for the beach. So a brilliant day for a conversation about how we train and educate uh, the very modern public servant uh, that we all uh, are or aspire to be, uh, or probably um, are engaged in in some form or another. It's terrific to see everybody here. Very timely conversation, I'm sure, which is why there are so many folks on this call, and I'm sure others will join through the recording later, because I think it's just, we're at a very, very interesting time as the public sector and the public services around the world grapple with a very different world and a rapidly changing world. What exactly does it mean to be a very modern public servant in the first place? Uh, we're going to explore that in just a moment with a few uh, uh, honourable guests uh, and some very interesting and eclectic experience we can bring to you. And also hopefully then get your involvement and your engagement uh, through the usual forms, chat room. We'll get some questions going if we can, but uh, myself and James will keep an eye on the chat and we'll uh, splice in uh, comments and observations too from the, uh, from the wider group. But what exactly do we mean then by a, um, a requisite education for the very modern public servant and we'll come to that in just a moment. The format, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time and I'll introduce each speaker as we go and as we get to them and I'm going to start in just a minute with Beth Novak, many of the people on this call I'm sure know Beth's work. Um, I'm going to start with Beth and we're going to have a, just a brief chat to kind of set the scene and perhaps open up a few themes and a few ideas. I'm then going to call on our panel members from around the world, and indeed they are around the world, as you'll find out when we introduce them later, um, to riff off some of those themes and add their own dimensions to uh, this conversation from their expertise, their experience, um, and frankly, their thinking, um, often very stirry thinking, I think, about where this conversation is heading into the next period. Um, and then we'll use the conversation with you as the wider group also to start thinking a bit about where we might be heading into the next period. And frankly, what some of the opportunities ahead of us are you know, for those of us who are interested in what it is we do to um, better equip and better train our public servants, and perhaps also some of the risks and some of the obstacles uh, of which there are many, I'm sure, um, and what we might do about them. So that's how we're going to uh, go. Um, as I say, keep those questions and comments coming in the chat room. We'll keep an eye on them and to the extent that I'm busy uh, directing a little bit of traffic here to make sure we finish in time and cover our territory. Uh, James will also keep a bit of an eye on that and feed through things to make sure that we don't miss too much um, as we go. So let me get started. Beth Novick, I'm sure, as I say, will be well known to many people in this room. Um, a writer, a researcher, uh, a public servant um, inside the belly of the beast. Um, and a commentator and frankly a teacher uh, and a substantive teacher in many different domains including here in Australia and with uh, our own ANZ School of Government and we have some uh, ANSOG folks with us um, to join in the conversation a little bit later and the author uh, also of her most recent book and it's the only plug I'll do but I happen to have it near my can you see that it's not probably coming through very well solving public problems a practical guide to fix our government and change our world in which there are some very trenchant statements made about what it is we need to do to equip our public servants for this uh, difficult world that we are trying to solve problems in. So I'm going to start with you, Beth, and I'm going to keep the focus very much on this absolutely central question. In contemporary and emerging conditions, what exactly constitutes, and I've used the phrase, a requisite education uh, for a, a very modern public servant? That, of course, is a quite question that begs lots of others, but let's start there. So in your experience, and perhaps we can start right where you are now in terms of your own writing, your own teaching and the work I know you're doing in New Jersey and other parts of the world, what exactly is the education we need to get uh, focused on for our very modern public servant? Lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you and to see so many friends uh, around the virtual table. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of expertise around this table, so I look forward to the discussion uh, both among the designated speakers, but also from people who are here to listen. I hope you will share what you're learning out in the field. Um, so, you know, the information, what is it, vegetable, mineral, and animal, that I think the very modern public servant needs to know uh, these days is really comes down to a set of skills 
that involve the use of technology, data, and community wisdom to enable us to solve problems for real people and improve their lives. So the skill set really needs to focus on the solving of public problems. I think Jesper mentioned a number of mindsets like humility and openness and one, whatnot that are extraordinarily important preconditions for us to be able to use these skills. But in my experience, the ability to pe for people at every stage of a problem solving process, that is to say, when we define a problem, when we come up with solutions, when we think about how to implement those solutions and then how to evaluate what works, we need to get better at using both data and what we could call engagement or collaboration or community wisdom. I think of it as data.gov and people.gov in my own parlance. Um, but the ability to do that is not innate. We are not training people to use these skills and we're not tra training them in a widespread enough way. So I have the great fortune to be a chief innovation officer and to lead an innovation team within government, but I'm 25 people in a public sector of 70,000 in the state of New Jersey. And unless I can bring along my agency colleagues for the ride to understand what it means to be more agile, to use data and human-centered design to truly define and understand a problem as people experience it, to use technology to be able to reach out outside of government, to look for solutions that have worked elsewhere, and to invent solutions with people through co-design and co-creation and open innovation, and then how to partner with other sectors, uh, whether it's private sector, or university sector, um, and then how to, again, turn to the wisdom of the crowd and use data in a faster way to be able to measure what works. I'm not going to be as good at doing my job as I need to be. So all the news in the United States this week, and you might be catching the headlines wherever you are, is that we have finally, 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 after much planning to make a plan, we have passed our $2.1 trillion infrastructure package to prepare yep. our uh, rotted roads and bridges and um, begin to provide some response to climate change. But where we are silent in these discussions is how we're going to spend that money effectively. And I think the glaring omission is the failure to talk about how we are going to upskill the public sector and how we're going to train people to do a better job at spending that and other money. So let me pause with that and, and uh, um, let yeah. you... No, that's a, that's a great. That's, that, no, no, that's a great start. Um, there are a couple of dimensions I'm going to tease out. I just want to come back to this idea about drawing, as you say, on the wisdom of the community. This idea of people.gov. It does seem to me that, generally speaking, the way we've trained our public servants hasn't had that as a preeminent uh, requirement, or how can I put this as part of the curriculum, if you like. It raises. So I'd like you to unpack that a wee bit more. But also, I want to start taking the next step that says we do have to do that job how are we going to have to start doing that is it more training sessions do we send them all off to lots of schools of government do we have to do a lot of this on the job like exactly how are we going to make this particularly if we want to do it relatively rapidly and relatively at scale yeah. but yeah take it a stage further if you could at least just so to let me let me speak to set. both of those questions so i think it goes further back than uh, being in government it goes back to when we're in school um, uh, you know, all it, in the United States, only 6% of our federal workforce is under the age of 30. Um, but even those who are under the age of 30, wow. if you're going to school for public administration or public policy today, uh, the kind of usual training grounds for going into government, you are not at the top schools required to learn data science. There are courses in data science now, there are courses in human centered design, but it is not a standard part of the curriculum yet. Um, and surely for people who are already in government, and it is not, you know, we're not going to do a good enough job fast enough to simply hire new people into government. It's not going to solve the problem fast enough getting to your second question already. So we do have to talk about what we're going to do with the people who are in government today. And the empirical work that we've been doing, uh, we did a survey supported by ANZOG together with our colleagues at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Rod is here, and I'm sure he'll talk to this a little bit. Um, really showed both in Australia and New Zealand, but also then we have been doing this survey in other parts of the world, um, is really showing that people do not possess these skills that we might think of as 21st century skills of using data mm. and unities and community wisdom, and then having the mastery of technology that allows you to do both of those things. But when they do learn those skills, they use them all the time. And there's a great hunger for training 
and I think for learning as evidenced by this. So what are we gonna do about this to your question about mm. how do we upskill people yeah. quickly enough? Um, number one, we obviously need vision from the top and we need that statement which says that public sector upskilling is important. Um, lots of conversations in the news now about private sector upskilling. I'm literally just now coming from a discussion about how to spend $10 million on giving training funds uh, to citizens, but we're not having these conversations about how to upskill the public sector. And the first and biggest way we're going to create incentive is when you have leaders from the top, as they've had in Germany, as they've had in Argentina, as they've had in Canada, where you have top leaders who are saying, we think public sector upskilling matters. Number one. Number two, we have to make training free. For most countries, that is the case where you have a civil service training academy, but there are other places, the United States being the notable exception, where we use fee for service uh, cost recovery models so that even if a civil servant doesn't have to pay out of pocket, their agency has to figure out which budget they use to pay back the agency that offers the training. Or they have so many opportunities between edX and Coursera and this and that and the other thing. There's just such an overwhelming amount of content. There's no through line. What are the things that I really must know forgetting about the things that might be nice to know. Um, so we need that vision and that big bet on training. We need to make it free. And then we need to take advantage of technology to be able to make training much more scalable. What we really ultimately want to get to is to doing what states of change does which is to provide real uh, high touch, deep dive coaching. That's about helping people to apply skills to their own projects, to advance their work from idea to implementation. But in order to get to the point where coaching is useful and meaningful and worth the investment of the much more high touch services, we can do a very, very lot to introduce new concepts to people. That's why in Canada, the bus rides program, you know, provides little recordings for people, sort of podcast, free podcasts, where you can learn things like big data and human centered design. It's why we're not only doing this work in New Jersey, but now thanks to some philanthropic support, creating a multi-state initiative to provide uh, boot camps to people on a free ongoing basis with content shared across multiple states thanks to new technology. So there's a lot we can do to be much more scalable. And then there are lessons learned, I think, about even on a, from a coaching perspective, where we want to get much more engaged about how to apply what we're learning to our projects, that we have seen examples in other countries that have had a really great success with actually helping people to apply those skills. You know, Argentina has trained 36,000 people doing it in a live face-to-face -face model primarily. Um, with a tremendous investment. And last thing I'll just say here is what's really important as we consider how to do this is that we keep our eye on the ball again of being focused on how we solve problems. And that means avoiding the, what I think about sometimes is the bright shiny object phenomenon. In other words, flavor of the month is behavioral insights or flavor of the month right. is human centered design or flavor of the month is X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. What we want to do is to give people skills to really solve a problem, not simply give them a tool without the mechanism for how to use it. I'm going to ask you one. That's terrific. And I'm sure all of our panel and indeed, as you say, the wisdom of this particular crowd will want to um, pack in on that particular topic. Another quick dimension I'm going to open up very briefly because it's quite a big one, I think, but we, I don't want to try and um, you know take it too far right now. But it's an important one. And that is the distinction often between the way we train and equip people who are in, broadly speaking, a service delivery or a direct problem solving versus what we're doing to the, some of the core policy development and policy skills within the public service. There's a debate going, it seems to me, in many <coughs> excuse me, jurisdictions, certainly here, uh, about the extent to which the public sector needs to spend a bit more time reinvesting and reinvigorating a, a, a really core policy capability in a problem solving mode, that's for sure. So there's a bit of this sense of how do we get past this dichotomy, which seems to have opened up between, you know, are we focusing on service delivery and solving the problem out there at the front line? Or is there a problem solving frame also much more core to that kind of policy skills? Do you want to just quickly riff on that for a minute or two, Beth, and then we're going to sure, open it up to the rest sure, of the Sure, just, just briefly, um, I, I think it's a false dichotomy. Um, I was hoping Sammy, you'd say that, but keep going. <laughs> he is, and I just want to say it's a good thing he's fully dressed. <laughs> <Five>. <laughs> yeah, that's um, good. Uh, 
the, uh, I think it's a false dichotomy because the core focus on really defining a problem that we're trying to solve as probably the first and foremost important skill that I think we fail to practice in the public sector for a lot of reasons that are outside our control, the political pressure that we're under, the desire to deliver results, the fact that we work in agencies that have a thing that they've always done, you know, everything looks like a hammer um, because we've always had a hammer uh, and therefore mm -hmm. uh, we don't spend time defining what the nail is. So I think that problem centric approach is really crucial in either frame. Yeah. Again, just well, to come right. back to a, yeah. a quick example, because it's the call that I just came from that I that I abandoned to, to jump over here, <laughs> is um, we have brought in outside consultants, and this is to alluding something to you said before, to help us figure out how to spend the $10 million we now have to give away for the pilot of lifelong learning accounts. Because the ability to say, who are the people we are trying to help? What's the problem that we're solving for them? What's the data that we have to show what's the right investment to make in terms of the policy design? In other words, to come up with a policy and mechanism design in the space of four weeks, which is about what I have to spend this money out to get this out the door before the legislature wraps us over the knuckles. Um, that's not a skill set we have in government. So we have to bring in outside people to help us stay focused on how do we use evidence? How do we use data? How do we bring in stakeholders? And above all, how do we do this quickly so that we can then uh, pilot something and learn from the results? There's no reason we shouldn't be able to do this. It's just not in our, uh, it's just not in our wheelhouse across the many yeah. agencies that we're dealing with. So I think it's a false dichotomy to see policymaking as somehow being exempt from, mm. uh, from this. And it's just that we've had a lot of discussions in our field about human-centered design which tends to focus on things like direct service delivery or making websites yeah. for people. And we exactly. have lost the discussion about policy um, and how it is equally susceptible to the same methods that we're talking about, if not more so. Fabulous, all right. Well, that's opened things up, <clears throat> excuse me. That's opened things up very nicely. I'm going to um, head off to the rest of our panel and our guests for the moment, and then we'll open it up again for the team. Same basic question really for each of our uh, contributors at this point. What is it that we think uh, a requisite education right now and as we look forward should be and should be uh, covering for this notion of the, the very model as exactly of a modern public servant? I knew we'd get to Gilbert and Sullivan eventually, so that's all good. Um, I'm going to go to Wellington in New Zealand, Aturia, and, and introduce Sally Washington who leads the ANSOG team at the moment in New Zealand, but also a couple of other quick pieces of information, some time back, but a very substantial role <clears throat> for a while at the OECD, but also led um, the early stages and the very, I think, one of the most exciting pieces of work I've seen around policy development, the policy project inside the New Zealand Public Service, the National Public Service in, in New Zealand. So Sally, I'm going to um, basically, yeah, I'll throw the floor open to you for a few minutes to see how you would want to riff on the central question of the morning for us, um, or indeed anything that you picked up from what Beth has started to stake out as some of this territory. Nice to see you. All yours for a few minutes. Tēnā koutou katoa, Morena from um, Wellington, New Zealand. So, um, yeah, I think um, um, what Beth said is music to my ears, but I think we need to think about that changing role of government too, so that it's you know, when we think about what skills you need, we need to think about skills for what. And I think, you know, the government is changing from being sort of just a service provider or doer and regulator or to then contracting and commissioning to much more like facilitator, broker, catalyst and partner. So what does that mean for how we have to operate? Um, so, and, and I think we need to stop thinking about competency so much too and about um, training or education and think more about learning and about um, what people need to what what people need to know, what they need to be able to do, and how we want them to behave. So that brings in that kind of mindset thing. Um, and then so and, and then um, what do we need them to learn? How do we want them to learn it? And how do we share what we learn? Because I think you know if we go back to that sort of old 70, 20, 10 kind of ratio for how people learn, um, most of it in in, um, in government is going to be on the job. So we and and so that's the 70%, 20% is learning from others, which is pretty interrelated. 
and the 10% is sort of the formal, the formal stuff. And um, so my work with, I, so I've worked with the UK head of policy profession as well, and there have been studies there and here in New Zealand saying that that kind of, and I shouldn't really be saying this because I'm working for the Australian and New Zealand School of Government, but um, uh, that sort of, that 10% of the formal stuff people see as, as less important for their career development and the jobs that they do, but it, it is really important and maybe that's, that 10% is what we need to shift as well. Um, so maybe I'll tell the, the story a little bit about the policy project and in particular how we articulated the skills for policy and I completely agree with, with Beth that it's a false dichotomy, this policy operation split which is sort of that new public management model that New Zealand was the poster child of. And, and it has caused a lot of problems because I think that there's, there's this kind of mindset and policy that I hope is changing, but is that I'm smart, so I'm right. And I come up with the great ideas and then I throw them over the fence to the, to the operations people and say, see what you can make of that. But it is what we want to do is have a much more iterative process and policy and operations, frontline people and the wider ecosystem involved right from the start. So it is that, how, how do we start the process? So I, what, I'm, what I want to talk about a little bit is how we developed this, um, we co-designed the skills framework, the policy skills framework in New Zealand. And I know Daniel and, and OECD has picked that up a little bit. Um, um, but it's, I, at the start, we talked about getting the basics right. So, so in policy, the, you know, the things like good writing, research analysis, and, and, and what policy people are there really is to support good decision making. So it's about briefing decision makers, briefing ministers, ensuring that, that they, you know, that they're, that what we elect people to, to for their ideas, we can actually articulate them and, and, and make things happen. So, and then, then, then we started thinking about innovating the policy practice. So with new methods, like Beth said, user-centered design, data and digital, digital skills, that sort of better, better engagement with the people that you're designing for and new mm. analytical frameworks. So thinking about gender analysis, um, analysis based on different ethnicity, and in particular, bringing in the indigenous people and, and their needs and different world views. So, and that's really, really important thing in, in New Zealand. And in, in that sense, sometimes it's just allowing people to make their own decisions and getting out of the way. But one of the things um, that struck me with um, Beth talking about, you know, behavioral insights or user-centered design or whatever, is that I think some of those new methods that we're bringing in, we need to think about what to apply them to and when. So I think we get um, disciples or zealots in some of these new methods and, and we fetishize them. So it, it, what I would like to see for the sort of modern public, even in particular in, in policy, is to think about having all of these things in your toolkit and, mm -hmm. and knowing what to bring out when and what sort of challenge they, they lend themselves to. And in that sense too, not just thinking about problems, but opportunities. And, and that was like, for me, I had an epiphany about design thinking because um, I could see it working in, in, in um, fashion and um, architecture and, you know, that you design around the needs of the, of, of the user. And, and I thought, holy shit, why aren't we doing this in, in policy? You know, it just, it makes so much sense. But, but it is about when you do policy work, you sort of, the, the, first, the first piece is to um, define the problem. And, and often we define the problem down to the point where we can manage it, which means it's, it's just we're, we're dealing with symptoms, whereas with design, you're opening up mm -hmm. and saying, what are the possibilities? So it's a completely different mindset yeah. and way of doing things. Um, so anyway, with, so we, we, we actually thought about this, how we would design um, a, 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 skills, a skills framework for policy, but bringing the people who had to, who were doing the work into, into that discussion. So yep. um, I can provide some, some um, written material if people are interested in that. But, um, but sort of um, actually, I think one of the things is to articulate actually what we want people to know to do and behave. And that's what we try to do in the skills framework. So, um, you know, often you see job advertisements for policy people and they say, we want them to have economics. They want to, they need to be blue skies thinkers um, and they need to be really good at project management. And to me that often they cancel each other out. So it's also thinking about um, uh, um, archetypes of people and of policy people. So they might be the great engagement person. They might be fantastic at writing or, um, briefing ministers or really, um, really good at data and, and, and analytics. But I think 
it's asking too much to have to think about that in one individual. Sure. And so I think we need to, the learning needs to be not just about individuals, but about, about teams, organisations, systems, and, and even whole jurisdictions. So, yeah. um, so taking it away from that, you know, learning as an individual pursuit to, it's, yeah. a, it's a team sport, and we need yeah. to think about that kind of um, analysis. And then if we go, um, if we go down to sort of, um, you know, the, the, the sort of mindsets, it is, it is that, exactly that um, being curious, empathetic, experimental, collaborative, um, and, 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 you know, just being able to bring different voices in to think about who are we designing for. Um, yeah. yeah, and I've got lots of things to say about leadership too, but that may become come Well, I'm sure, I, I can't imagine we're going to get out of the word without the, mentioning the word leadership <laughs> yeah. a, a well, little bit. So and, just... and that's, the whole, that's, where it, that's where it hits, the rubber hits the road, is that, that multi-business kind of leadership. Indeed. and. Yeah. No, it's great. That's great. Well, uh, do hold, hold that thought because we'll come back to it. The other thing, if I can encourage you, you might want to put into the chat a few links to other yeah, some of the references will, you've made because yeah. I noticed that's happening on the chat already, which is great. Yeah. Um, so already we're beginning to share in the right way. Um, I must say I was struck very much by your comment earlier. I was doing some work last year with one of our big en energy regulators. And one of the big problems these very smart, very, very clever, very technically clever uh, public servants had realised was, and it was their phrase, being right isn't enough. Um, and it was a kind of oh shit! Now what do we do? Um, it was kind it's of like if you, if you yeah, might have to go. You might have to go and talk to some people. You know who knows? I don't know. Uh, brilliant it's analysis, like but anyway, enough. It's like enough. They're, they're the smartest person in the room. You're in the wrong. Room. Yeah, exactly. Exactly is off in the room. Um, let me go to uh, Melbourne and Sam. Sam is right in the middle of this conversation because she works for the Victorian Public Service Commission. Sam, you might want to just say a few words in a minute about what you're doing and what that uh, organisation does. But again, what's your take on our question of the day? How are we going to educate our very modern public servants, in your case, very much in the uh, in the Victorian context? Good to see you. What are yours? Nice to see you. And thanks very much. And um, I think it's, it's there's so much I'm getting neck crick from like nodding along to people very <laughs> vigorously. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, look, I think it's really interesting and it's particularly interesting because government is such a, it's such a linear organization. And really what we all know is that the world is messy and complex and everything, you know, is largely emergent despite our best efforts to channel it into nice straight lines about things. Um, and so, you know, absolutely there is lots of, um, I think the, and the commission is in, in a Victorian in the state sense has really got that role of trying to be the steward for the people and looking to the future of, of, of the public service um, and making sure that it does have those skills and capabilities. And I think a huge amount of work does go into, you know, having the right frameworks and having the right curriculum and having the right um, structures and, and skill sets that you can bring in and toolkits and so on. Um, I think and I think there's a complementary kind of stream that we need to, I don't know, maybe encourage a little bit more, um, which is around the um, more the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is bringing in expertise to tell people how it's done. And the truth is in any environment or any community, there are always people pushing the boundaries. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity to start really fostering peer-to-peer um, -peer learning because like you know we've done we've all done the labs and the agile and the human-centered design and the, and they're wonderful and they're limited because life's complicated um, and it's all in what you do how you work with people building the relationships that enable you know things to get pushed further and problems to be solved because it's all underpinned by trust and networks and and I wonder if there's this opportunity in government, which is so hostile to all of that soft stuff, you know, to really um, start to look at how do we foster peer to peer learning and lived experience, bringing that in and accrediting it and making that part of our capability that complements the former training that complements the capability frameworks and what we all need, because um, we've had huge take up with our um, Naply named Innovation Network, um, which has been going for four years now, but it's got like 15,000 members and is largely populated by people within government sharing yeah. stuff that they're doing, how it works, yeah. what doesn't work, and building those relationships. And so I feel like that's like a whole area of infrastructure that we might want to think about introducing into the government context. 
Yeah, I think it's that's that, that is fascinating. There's a there's a similar network, of course, in Brisbane. I know in Queensland. I think I think some of these networks can be uh, slightly unsung heroes of some of this conversation mm. and probably doing some of this requisite learning and education in ways that you know are quiet but not uh, but very much on on song. Um, the other thought I had, and we, uh, you might want to take this on notice, I was incredibly struck by the statistic from Beth, and I, th I assume Beth it was the National Public Service in uh, in Washington, it's only 6% under 30. There is something interesting about the profile of our interest in this notion about what we're inviting young people to get inv involved in. Um, I'm told in many universities now getting to undergraduates to go do public admin is actually quite a tough ask because they're busy doing things like you know, politics. and a horrible you know, name, and, public administration. Yeah, well, indeed, indeed. Anyway, you might, you might want to take that on notice. We might come back to that. Um, I'm going to switch focus now. Um, I just had, suddenly occurred to me in Melbourne, there is an end of Melbourne, which I think is often referred to by some people in Melbourne as the Paris end of Melbourne. So we're actually going to go to Paris. Uh, that was a brilliant segue, I think you'll realise, Dan. Fantastic. Um, we are actually going to Paris, and this uh, we're going to talk to Daniel Gerson, who's with the OECD uh, around public, uh, leading a significant work on public management. Again, Daniel, I'll get you to talk a little bit about your work and set some context, and then very much the floor is yours for your take on this conversation, the same core question. Very nice to see you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's 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 great to be with all of you, and uh, and and definitely to not be the smartest person in the room, as Sally mentioned. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, in learning mode myself because uh, I can't, you know, I'm just sucking it all up, which is really the core of my job. And so I'm really lucky because I think I I get to learn things every day, and I think that's that's sort of fundamental to uh, what we're trying to also encourage in public services across the world. Um, of course, the OECD is, is, is an organization with um, tons of different areas of focus. Uh, so I have the pleasure of, of focusing on public employment and public management and, and people management really in government. Uh, and we, we see a lot of um, challenges in this particular space and trying to raise its importance and trying to really convince, I think, as, as Beth was saying, to try and convince leadership that it's something worth investing in. Uh, it's a it's a really opportune moment though because there is so much money right now in Europe especially and and of course um, in other countries uh, with money flowing into to support recovery planning uh, that I think all of a sudden people are scratching their head and going wait do we actually have the public sector that can spend this effectively that can actually make this do what it's meant to do um, so I do see a window of opportunity here but what we're launching right now is a, as a sort of a new piece of work. Um, and, and I think this, this picks up a bit on uh, what Sally was saying. We've, we've been doing work around skills and, and you know, trying to think about skills frameworks. And we've done some work with our Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, the OPSI, which um, some of you on this call are probably very familiar with, uh, who I work closely with on these themes around innovation skills. And one of the things we've done with that is, is turned it into a bit of a measurement tool as well. And we've done a few surveys and, and studies in a couple of different countries, trying to get a sense from public servants as to how they feel about their skills in these areas. But not only that, we also asked them how they felt about their manager's skills and how they felt about their organizational readiness to actually be able to put these skills to work. And what we found uh, often is this perception from public servants who answer these surveys that their skill sets are mediocre. They're they're pretty um, they're pretty uh, uh, modest with uh, with their own self perception, but pretty much across the board, they usually see their manager skills as far lower and incapable of really integrating these skills that they're learning into the workplace, and their organization usually sort of even a bit worse than than their direct manager. Um, so for this kind of led us into asking, well, what does it actually take for uh, an organization to integrate these skills, to be able to take skills that people have perhaps learned uh, and actually make proper use of them? Uh, what does it take for managers to be able to create a learning culture in their organizations, uh, to be able to actually redefine their role as someone who is there to organize uh, the shift and make sure all the machines are running on time. From that to somebody who is actually there to coach, to train, to develop their, uh, their team and to build a workforce that is actually capable of doing the job that 
uh, that politicians, that citizens expect them to be able to do. So this, this is sort of where we're looking right now, where we're thinking about the learning culture of a public organization, what kind of investments are required to actually make sure that the skills that people learn find a place in the organization that can use them. I was I was struck and and um, perhaps you know happily surprised to hear Beth say that when when uh, people learn these kinds of skill sets, they find immediate uses for them. And I think if we're talking about you know digital uh, data specific skills, then there's definitely a lack for them. And and you know everybody I talk to is usually trying to figure out how to integrate those into their work. But then even you know the question still goes: Do we have people in policy positions, right? Uh, despite our, our um, fear of that term, people in policy positions who would actually understand how to use these data skills effectively, even mm -hmm. a team of data scientists who were able to, uh, to do interesting work. Um, how do we make sure that, you know, what, what does that, that leadership and management sphere actually look like? Um, the other thing that we've been looking at that uh, Sam sort of mentioned is this peer-to-peer -peer learning thing. And, and I think one of the, the themes that we have seen significantly uh, coming to the forefront in many organizations and in many countries is this question of diversity. And, um, and even you know, the question of who is a public servant today? What, where do they come from? What's their background? We used to talk about professional public servants as if it's sort of one set of skills and competencies that a public servant has. And, and today, I think we're talking more about public services of many professions, uh, mm -hmm. working side by side, ideally coming in from various different backgrounds, different walks of life, different career paths. Um, that creates a really opportune space for peer learning. Uh, so how do we make the most of that? How do we make sure that even that that as more people are coming into the public service for shorter periods of time, not necessarily their entire careers, that we're able to generate the kind of learning and and sharing in that space? So I think I do think there's a lot of um, really interesting questions as we look into this organizational architecture as to you know how do how do people learn? How do we actually make that learning stick? Uh, where do they learn from? Uh, so. So that's what we're going to try and start digging into in the next few uh, months. Great. When, and there's a, there's an awful lot in everything you've just said that we can uh, perhaps unpack a little bit further, but that, that's terrific. Let me, we've got a couple more that I want to put on the uh, table, a couple more of our experiences, and we're going to go to Australia's capital next and talk to Shubo Banerjee in Canberra, and then we'll wrap up this first round with Rod back in Melbourne. Um, but I will encourage people, please, to, there are some questions beginning to emerge, which is great. I've got the chat open here. So please uh, barrel in because we've got some time shortly to then start exploding some of these things out a bit before we perhaps bring for our last chunk of the conversation questions back a little bit to so how are we going to prosecute this agenda? That's terrific. But Shubo, um, again, a few words with you to, from you about where, what you're doing currently for Ansel as the research director, but um, obviously somebody with background inside the public service at a very senior level uh, in the consulting world and somebody who I think has been thinking very, I know, has been thinking a lot about these questions of skills, capabilities and uh, underlying, if you like, values and virtues of what it is to be a modern public servant in this very rapidly changing environment. But again, welcome to you, nice to see you. A few minutes for you would be great, thanks. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, pleasure to join you all. Uh, to uh, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra. So uh, fantastic to get the chance to uh, join such an interesting group. And like Sam, I've been doing a lot of nodding in the background because it's been <laughs> fantastic to hear uh, fellow panellists and uh, I've, I've learned a lot from other contributions already. And it's actually, I think, Martin, a good segue from Daniel because what I had in mind uh, really does go to embedding learning as well, but I'll, I'll come to that in, in just a minute. Firstly, when I was thinking about the questions for the panel this morning, the, the way that it was put seemed to me to start with what do you need to know? And I think when we're starting to think about what do you need to know, I think there is a reasonable case to think, well, what is the core domains that a public servant needs to pursue for excellence? What, what does that look like? And how do we really focus down on what 
contemporary excellence looks like you know and and how do we how do we really narrow down to the particular skill set the particular values the particular requirements of being a public servant not just being good at stuff but being a really mm. good public servant and uh, Anzog did some work with uh, the Australian Public Service, which uh, led to the establishment of the APS Academy here, uh, which had a crack at thinking about what those domains of excellence are at a high level. And uh, I can, I'll can i send through the links uh, uh, through Sorry. the chat, but really yeah. it was about working in government, the skill set around working in government, thinking about policy and delivery and thinking about policy and delivery together in the ways that we've been talking about here, Thinking about partnership and engagement and the distributed nature of problem solving, which we've also talked about here, leadership and management and integrity. And so I'll, I'll send that through, but rather than the domains themselves where people have already made terrific contributions, I was interested then to go from that to this idea of craft and practical wisdom, that it's in the doing to be a public servant. And uh, when we think about educational public servants, we need to think about how to assist them in the doing. And so that, that's just a bit of a different mentality in thinking about education. The formal instruction is incredibly important as a base, but then it's also how is that uh, consolidated uh, in terms of broader peer learning and other, other mechanisms? And then how do you keep working at it in your workplace in, the specific, in your everyday job? And so I think thinking in that kind of way about what the the kind of framing as practical wisdom and then how do you keep developing your craft is a really important way of thinking about it and perhaps a slightly broader way than just thinking about in a sense a curriculum that you then taught and then you go and do it's much more in the in the doing and that's what panelists have been talking about as well and I just wanted to kind of really push push that way of thinking about it so then what does that mean for your capability development agenda I think it means really strongly that you need to be thinking about uh, moving to uh, how you continue to reinforce that, how you get opportunities to reinforce your learning, how as an organisation you become a learning organisation and how you embed that throughout the organisation. And as Daniel foreshadowed and uh, we're doing, uh, we're starting to do a little bit of work with Daniel's team in thinking about similar issues, um, that really, really goes to uh, to what extent can you apply? What are the preconditions for being able to apply? And how do you keep learning through your craft, you know, yeah. through, through your practice? And that's really hard, really, really, really hard. So, in fact, there is a bunch of empirics out there that says in the learning and development space, uh, often, at least in the Australian Public Service, where I'm more familiar, uh, there is still a scepticism about the original value of l and it, It's downgraded as a, as a kind of option in a sense. And uh, sadly, there are instances where it's really seen as something that you send the, you know, if, if you, the person that is least, least pressed in a particular time is kind of sent off to go yeah. and do training while the rest yeah. of us get on and do our stuff. That's yeah, exactly. just fatal. Right, that is, yeah. that's absolutely yeah. fatal. Like, if it's not seen as a way of developing everyone, and particularly developing our best performers, then we're in serious, serious trouble. So we need to think about taking responsibility for what kinds of capability development offerings or learning and development offerings really are so mainstream that people think that's fantastic. I, I want to go and do that. I want to get better at my job and that's going to you know that's going to allow me to come back and do great things you've got to be rewarded for that but you've got to be given the space to be able to do that and it's got to be welcomed when you come back and there is a, a, a i think where uh learning development offerings are actually seen as high quality there is often a frustration about not being able to practice when you come back that the the kind of broader management settings as daniel was saying are so yes. crucial to think about whether or not you're actually going to get the opportunity to apply these things that you have been learning about and that often you come back fired up and ready to go and you're in a, in a kind of broader circumstance, which makes it quite difficult to, to exercise this new way of thinking. And so I think that idea of what is the right culture, how do you think about that in a very fundamentally mainstream way? This is this is what it means to be excellent in public service. It's not just yeah. some add-on 
of yeah. kind of herbs and spices at the end. This is what it means. <laughs> To be a learning organisation is excellence in public service. How do we not get that or how do we get that to be a mainstream performance issue for yeah. agents? When you, when you think about the overall capability development or overall performance of agencies and secretaries and leaders, how is this main, made as a kind of essential part of their performance and their performance yeah. loop and thinking about that on, at a service-wide level? So when you think in that way, I think, that then has the subsidiary benefit that this is the kind of organisation that people want to work in. You know, this, this, is, this is a really crucial part and Beth and, uh, and Rod's work goes to this. These are the types of organisations that particularly younger people want to work in, that they mm. want to come to public service to do this kind of work and be involved in these kinds of organisations. So, so there's a nice alignment between this kind of learning agenda, learning organisation agenda, and the kind of public sector reform that we need to pursue more broadly for excellence in public service. So, you know, yeah. you can think about this as a learning agenda, or you can think about it more broadly as part of what broader public sector reform needs to be to get the kinds of organisations that we want, which are genuinely aligned and fantastic places to work. I'm going to give two things I keep coming back to from all of your contributions and Rod, up, <clears throat> excuse me, Rod, we're going to throw to you in just a minute and then I will give Beth a chance to reflect on anything she's just heard before. Again, the chat is opening up and please feel free to, to throw some questions in. But there is an interesting dilemma emerging here, which is if we focus on, so what are we doing about skills and training and teaching and all the rest of it? and don't do anything about bigger questions of institutional design and the word leadership will come in here, I think, Sally and others, then we're going to be in trouble. And the question is, what, is it realistic to assume that we can sort of fix, if I'm going to use the wrong word, but fix the sort of learning and teaching problem without also somehow having an impact on these other bigger settings? Because if we don't, we're going to have these conversations and these seminars forever and a day where people keep saying, and I was really interested in Daniel's observation, slightly self-effacing, I think, public say, oh, we're not very good at this, you know, we're not very good at embedding all this stuff, you know, and it's sort of the cycle seems to feed on itself. Anyway, I'll leave that thought for a moment because I'd like to touch on it a bit uh, more deeply. Rod, I'm going to throw to you finally, um, in this round anyway, <clears throat> um, I know you and Beth obviously have been working for the uh, on the ANSOL uh, piece of work which Beth has now shared, but again, brief word on your background would be useful for folks, I think, including where you are now in Monash University, Australia's largest public university, as far as I remember. Is that still right? Have I got that right? I hope I have. You have got that um, right now. But, well but particularly at the Institute, uh, but also somebody who spent a considerable amount of your career inside the, uh, inside the machine and worrying very much about these topics for a long period now, about skills, capabilities and values. Over to you for a minute. Nice to see you. Yeah, so thanks, Martin. Uh, so my background is basically a third of my time inside the public service, generally running strategy and innovation functions, a third of my time in politics uh, as a strategic innovation advisor, and a third of my time on the outside working with those two uh, and with a lot of social entrepreneurs. And the focus of much of my work is, is actually on a particular class of problem. It's not on everything the public sector does. It's on how do we solve those wicked problems, the complex, the uncertain and the contested problems. Um, and I'd really strongly endorse what um, something that Sally said about this. You won't find the solutions in one person. Um, mm. A lot of the work I do with Beth is all about kind of, we do actually think there's a real value in every public servant having a breadth, of having a broad literacy uh, of the types of skills that or the types of traits that can be drawn on. But we're not all fast thinkers. Uh, we're not all slow thinkers. Uh, they're found in different people. Uh, we don't all have a think with a mic, look through a microscope or a telescope. Uh, they're different people. Jim Flaherty, the Canadian finance minister, had a great saying at budget time that on his desk was a microscope and a telescope. And he had to have that ability to zoom in and zoom out. But mm. don't try to look mm. through both at once because you get nothing but a headache. <laughs> and there's a real cognitive dissonance when we try and conflate everything into the single person being the fast thinker, the slow thinker, the micro, the macro the exploiter of knowledge and the extender of knowledge. So I think a bit of humility about the complementary skills that other people can bring. Um, uh, so I think there's something that we don't actually teach much in the public sector and we don't talk about much. And it's actually the question that I think a lot of public servants care most about, which is the big question of how do you shift systems and societies? Uh, the larger scale questions. And I, I think that we've, we, 
out of COVID, it's interesting. We have a lot of conversation about what are we going to learn about how agile we were. But one of the obvious lessons of COVID is just how interconnected our systems are. And I think there's less conversation about how are we going to learn to reintegrate, how are we going to learn to recouple, how are we going to learn that we can solve some problems by making the problem bigger, not smaller. We can see more when we look wider or we look longer. We can see opportunities that we can't see if we're looking through a microscope rather than a telescope. Um, so I think there's, we're going to see a bit of a resurgence of the conversation around system thinking, not as system thinking has been in the past, but that bigger question of how do we shift systems and societies. And then in that, I think there's a really interesting role of, I, I think the craft point is a really powerful one, but I think there's something that complements craft for a public servant, and that's stewardship. And the stewardship role of a public servant is quite unique. A public servant has two masters. It serves a public interest and it serves a government of the day. So it's always a constrained authority. So its stewardship is only part of the stewardship of systems and societies. It's alongside political leaders. It's alongside social change agents. It's alongside academics and others. So thinking about what that stewardship role is. Uh, and then I just want to touch on one thing that I think we, we have no conversation at all about in the public sector and sometimes even deliberately, and I think it's mistaken, and that's political complexity. Uh, so all of our literature around wicked problems and complexity we talk about the complex, the uncertain, the contested spaces, but we never actually follow that through. Sometimes we can't get hard, think, difficult reforms up because not everyone in our debate is reasonable. Not everyone in our debate is rational. Not everyone else in our debate is nice. Sometimes politics is made up of zero sum game, a zero sum game when somebody just wants to kill you. And, and that's a pretty brutal view of how politics actually plays into the policy conversation and the public conversation. And that makes it the job so much harder, but it also makes the job so different. And I think it's actually taking, to us, taking us to a place where it won't be the traditional model of public sector leadership or the traditional model of political leadership, but a new space of new institutional design that is not constrained by the same things of those operating models, but recognises both of them. And I think when we think of that, there are new institutional forms that we can create that are of higher bandwidth, that draw on the full set of actors and methods that are also higher energy, that can draw on more rapid learning than government can in its normal processes, and can draw on open democratic conversation in a way that it doesn't at the moment. So I think this, and this is a lot of the Mariana work, obviously, about when you bring it down to how do you do missions, you are trying mm. to really create systems of high bandwidth and high energy. Uh, and I think that runs up against challenges for our politicians. So part of my job is uh, I'm the academic director of the McKinnon Institute of Polit for Political Leadership. So I'll tr train our politicians. When you ask them about this kind of stuff, they'll come back and say, well, th that butts up against ministerial accountability. I got elected to solve this problem. Yeah. Similarly, in the public sector, uh, there's an assumption that that stewardship role is only with us sometimes, that this is my job to solve that problem. Actually, it's, it's a shared job. It's a responsibility we share with others. Uh, so I, I do think this hope in new institutional forms, and I'll give you one example of it that's not used very often, but it's, it's a cracker, which is in 1976 and 1980, Australia performed terribly at the Olympic Games. We created the Australian Institute of Sport. We gave it the autonomy to do whatever the hell it needed to do to create the, highest, the, the strongest high-performance sports system in the world. And it did. Uh, what are our Australian institutes of sport and for what problems or for what challenges going forward? Uh, but, but it's not going to sit inside a government agency. I'll let Very it interesting up. analogy for those who know the story. What's really intriguing about that story is that it was conceived by a Labor government and executed by a Liberal government with almost, with almost no um, change to the basic idea. It was just almost seamless. Um, Seems to me that may be a difficult thing to expect from our political environment, particularly for uh, in the real politics of uh, life, there are some people out to kill other people and it's a pretty brutal environment, which sometimes hasn't got much truck for questions of stewardship and long-term thinking and all the rest of it. So that's also very tough. <clears throat> Beth, I'm gonna invite you if you uh, are, would like to, not to comment on everything that's just been said, because there's a hell of a lot that we're going to go back and unpack in a minute. But I am particularly interested in this notion, we started our conversation appropriately, and I know it's very much a focus of your work about public problem solving. And we've ended a little bit this first round with the notion of, are we thinking 
large enough about the systemic and social dimensions of the problems we're trying to solve. And then the risk of that is, can that become too big and too overwhelming and we're just slightly mesmerized by the sheer enormity of the task? Do you have any kind of quick reflections on how that dynamic between problem solving and the bigger system shifting that Rod's just put on the table um, works out or has worked out in your experience? It will come as no surprise that I agree strongly with everything that Rod <laughs> said. Um, so it's a chance to double down a bit on, cool. on really his formulation. But, you know, there's been so many wonderful reflections and I'm uh, also in the chat. Um, just a lot of great, uh, you know, shared learning here. And frankly, the fellowship and companionship that's needed to do what is in the end very, very hard work as we're hearing. And as, as obvious as it may seem to everybody on this call, it is by no means self-evident to most of the people that we deal with on the day-to-day -day, um, what it takes to do this. And frankly, our learning around the learning science of how do we actually accomplish this in practice is, I think, very far behind. Um, I think though your question, uh, I, I wanna pick up on your question and bring in one other point that Sam made as well, um, which is the, the question of how we define a problem appropriately. And I think Rod really speaks to the fact that in our process of defining the problem, uh, we need on the one hand to narrow it to a place where we can actually take action. Um, but we need an understanding of what it means to take action in the world of networks and in the world in which we can leverage many more people than just ourselves or even our immediate colleagues in our own offices. So understanding what technology, but big data, what community wisdom can do for us in terms of defining a problem potentially more ambitiously than we may have set out to do previously, um, I think is where this skill set comes in. Number one. Number two, coming back to a point that Rod made, the recognition that these are not skill sets we have to have alone, that the fact that we can reach out to other people in order to benefit from their complementary skill sets and as a team and as a network, again, potentially do things in a more innovative way, but then also as part of that problem of really trying to understand the problem, we have to have that systemic view, that macro, meso, and that micro view, that most multiple layers, the microscope and the telescope that Rod talks about. I think that's part of our process of really understanding and unpacking a complex problem. Yesterday, I had a chat with the chair of a history department to try to persuade him to engage in this foolhardy effort to say, look, for us to truly understand problems, we need more actionable understanding of history. We need the context on a problem from a societal mm -hmm. perspective, from a historical perspective, from a cultural perspective. And you guys are not helping in the way that you're working as a discipline in order to help us solve problems more effectively. Um, he was a, a, a like-minded fellow traveler, so he, he took the, the criticism well um, and was, was amenable to being supportive. But again, this ability to really understand the broader context of a problem uh, geopolitically, from a power perspective, from a critical and a racial, racial and a gender lens and an economic mm -hmm. lens, as we all know, is really crucial. But all of that said, we need skills for doing these things quickly. We're not doing PhDs here. Um, some of us may be on the side or want to be, but um, we have problems that we have to solve in real time. So this is about developing a real kind of discipline and it is a field that we need to cultivate for how do we do this kind of learning that doesn't just jettison the macro and the complexity perspective to the side simply in the interest of expediency. Um, and so the other point I wanna pick up here is that uh, I, I think it does come down to having a discipline around problem definition and a set of tools and training for what that means. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to just triple down on a point that Sam made earlier about how peer-to-peer -peer learning also helps with that. Um, because we can do a lot of things in the abstract, but then in the end, it comes down to how do we apply these things in the real world? And that's where teaching and training from one another is crucial. So as we think about the science of learning and what we can do in terms of platforms and new skills and uh, sorry, new, new platforms and tools, we have to think about how we create the infrastructure for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Most governments now either deliver top-down training that they organize through their civil service commissions or as, as training academies, or they contract with vendors who provide those tools. Um, but there's very, very little space for people to teach one another except in informal mm -hmm. contexts. 
Um, and there's very little way of actually organizing that. So, you know, we're building phenomenal infrastructure in the United States, for example, for distributed learning, all of which comes out of the Defense Department. It's all driven by the ability to teach teach people how to shoot small women and children. I mean, small children and women <laughs> and burn their villages or whatever it is. Um, so it's driven by the military, but it's allowing us on the civilian side to create the infrastructure for learning. But again, we have no, no vision for what it could mean for us to actually teach and learn from one another, except for the informal communities of practice concept. So I think that's a place that we really need some radical innovation much faster in terms of how we build things. <clears throat> Fabulous. Um, we're going to start pivoting a little bit, and I'm going to put all of our panelists and all of our guests on notice, and indeed the rest of us. I'm very interested to make sure before we finish, and we've got around about a half an hour or a bit more, um, so we've got plenty of time to, to open it up. I'm, it, it's an amazingly rich conversation, um, and if it's not rich enough uh, on the screen uh, in a, these exchanges, um, I hope you're all following the, um, uh, the chat, which is uh, getting richer and richer by the moment. Um, I'm assuming when we all go back into the office, by the way, we're going to have to have meetings on Zoom without, uh, you know, because where's the chat function when you're face to face, right? In fact, when you use the chat function, when you're in a face to face meeting, it's called rude. You know, people say, no, no, no pay attention. Um, and what's happily being proved here is that we don't need to be, you know, single focus. So there's an amazing array of um, insights and examples. So please use the chat, mine it like that. And I'm going to go back and pick up one particular topic, actually two or three that I want to go back to the to the panel on, but I do want to spend a bit of time getting a sense from all of you about how you think we're tracking on this conversation right now. And it's not really a meant to be a, a critique of any particular organization or system, but I'm just interested. There's such a, such a uh, strong and positive sense about what we could be doing here and are doing to some extent. And Beth, you know, you've given examples from Argentina and all over the world, and we've all got great examples, but I'm going to get you to think a bit before we finish and I'm putting you on notice here, how you think we're actually tracking this conversation. Because it does strike me that there are moments when if you're at the front line, we don't appear to be making as much progress in some of these things as we should be. These conversations are great. They're very energizing. They're incredibly inspiring. And I hope you can tell by my voice, I'm uh, energized and inspired. Um, but when you then go back inside the public service, um, you often hear stories that seem to be almost completely contradictory to almost everything you guys have said, and I'm slightly overdoing it, but only for a bit. So I'm gonna get you to talk a little bit about that because I want to finish with some uh, predictions, if you like, or not so much predictions, but some sense about how we're tracking and what are the risks and opportunities for the pace and intensity with which this agenda has got to get going in the next, well, two to three years, never mind 10 to 20 years. So that's, uh, that's one thing, but I am gonna open it up to the panel, a couple of questions from the uh, chat. One of them is this issue about incentives and conditions. What is it you think we are already doing? What examples do you have that we are, you know, this might be Sally, a place to bring the leadership issue back again, but what are we doing to create and energize a set of conditions and incentives that make many of the behaviors that you've called out as necessary to train? And uh, Dan, I might start with you a little bit, if I could, uh, given your OECD angle, I know you've got a Canadian background, but also just looking more broadly. What are we doing or how well do you think we're doing to get the kind of conditions and incentives piece right? Because if we don't, I think the question on the chat was suggesting we get a little bit hamstrung. I hope that's not too um, unfair, but I'm very keen to get everybody to chip in. And Daniel, maybe you'd like to start off with at least some reflections on that. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly a very difficult one to track because I think it's something that really depends on personal relationships in a lot of cases. I think yeah. in general, um, we're not doing very well. I mean, when I say we, I'm thinking about most governments uh, across the OECD and and beyond. Uh, we, when when I think of the Australian and Canadian examples, I think there's probably a lot of of, of good pockets of very interesting work being done. Uh, in in certain places, but often those are tied to particular people to particular um uh units within a particular agency and but but when you know I, I won't name countries but I was recently in a few where um where the basic perception of, of public management or a public administration or a public service is just mm. very narrowly regulation rules and and mm. 
getting beyond, you think that, you know, we're moving beyond that. And then you, you spend a bit of time in these administrations and realize that we're not. Uh, many, many administrations still hire only lawyers. And, and, you know, I have nothing personally against lawyers, but, but when you hire an organization full of them, um, <clears throat> it's a different way of thinking and it's a, it's a particular challenge. So I think that there's, um, there, there's a lot of room for this conversation to nurture. When we were designing uh, some of the, the fundamental tools that we use at the OECD, we were doing a bunch of, of workshops with international uh, participants and, and somebody said uh, uh, something, we were, we were trying to talk about what, what we wanted this tool to do, it was our, our recommendation on public service leadership and capability. And, and she said clearly, you know, this really just has to frame the role of public servants as people who solve public problems rather than just narrowly apply the law. And, and when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's so basic. But it's it's still something that resonates strongly in a lot of places I work in. And so if that's our starting point, then there's a lot of room for this to uh, to take hold. Let me throw that open to our members of the group. And again, Sally, you might want to pick this up and it might be a good place to bring the leadership issue in here. And I mean leadership in the broadest sense, not just at an agency level, but this notion of setting, getting conditions and incentives right, as I say, it came up in the chat room. And I do think it it, it speaks quite directly to our capacity to actually, <coughs> excuse me, not just prosecute this agenda, but as, a, as I'm hearing it, speed it up and intensify it. What's your reflection on that? Yeah, so um, I guess I think in terms of, um, you know, we're talking about changing a system. Um, and if I think about the work that I did in New Zealand with the policy project, it was thinking about that as an infrastructure. So um, developing skills is one part of it, but um, but it is about teams and organisations and systems and ecosystems and how they all fit together. And I guess um, one of the ways that we learn on the job is that we ha if we have the right tools and frameworks to use, so that that sort of pivots us into a different way of working. And, and that was that was one of the most important parts of, of, of the, um, the policy project was thinking about what's a great policy organisation, what's a great policy advisor, and what's great policy advice, and, and then what sort of toolkits do you need sitting underneath mm -hmm. it to support so if we think about a whole infrastructure and how those things work together to enable and support people to do what you want them to do. So it's sort of like creating that environment where um, people can learn, articulating what, the, what you want them to do, and then having those frameworks that are and tools that are easy to use and hard to avoid. Some can be taught, some learnt on the job. And then so you're, you're, um, you're, you're sort of encouraging them to work in certain ways. And, and I liked what um, Rod was saying about that whole, the whole stewardship thing. And I think that's really important yeah. because, we, because of that, the political space that we work in and that political administrative interface, we, um, we, we get stuck in that short termism of, of election cycles. And, and I think in New, in New Zealand, we've done some things. That, um, so stewardship has been part of the responsibilities of chief executives um, in legislation for some time. And just recently in the Public Service Act that was passed last year, we've also got this thing now where departments have to produce um, long-term insights briefings that go that are yeah. public. So they're directed to, the, um, to, to parliament, not to political parties and not to the particular minister which in, in theory brings all of these insights about the, about the future into makes them available to other political parties. So should hopefully shift the, shift the debate you know, away from just short-term election mm -hmm. cycles. And, and in that sense too, that sort of um, being aware of that, of that political context. So like ne next week, I'm, I'm working on a workshop with a department in South Australia, a whole workshop on... Um, because they've adopted the New Zealand policy skills framework, but we're doing a whole workshop on political savvy and political now yeah. and how do, you, yeah. how, do you, how do you develop that? But, but <coughs> then again, a whole team working on that together. So it's not just you know, individuals going off on a course, but a team learning together, which I think is, is really important and how we bring yeah. that into, into our work. I think sometimes we can experiment on ourselves. So yeah. one of the things in, the, in, in um, co-designing the policy um, infrastructure in New Zealand is it was very much a co-design process and we use things like personas in, in um, designing, you know, using user-centered design, but amongst ourselves and people learn the benefit of those techniques by using them. And I, I sort of think 
can't, couldn't we be using nudge on ourselves as well or some of those other techniques so people learn by doing but you're your your own you're your own subject and object so yeah, um, yeah. yeah those, those are the sort of thoughts that i had I think in the days when I worked at Cisco, we used to call that eating your own dog food or something of that sort or something but equally it, elevating. It could, be even, it could be even worse. And I didn't even touch on leadership. <laughs> but the whole thing for me, leadership is about, um, about getting away from that hero, um, you know, I'm decisive and I'll tell you what to do to, to more yeah. the, um, the, yeah. the host collaborative leader. And, and, and that, that says quite different things about what I, what I think our leaders have been in the past and, and sure. also says quite a lot about gender and ethnicity where there totally. are different ways of working. Anyway. Totally. Let me, Shubo, let me bring you in at this point. Um, and there was also interesting, a question in the chat directed specifically at you, but also perhaps the others, about how we get a more collective view uh, of, of this training notion rather than seeing this as a sort of an individual thing that you go off and tick off. Um, and how do we do it? It's interesting, of course, states of change is exactly premised on this notion, right? It's groups of people doing immersive training and immersive and intense training. But this notion of conditions and, and incentives, again, I know you're a, an avid student uh, of exactly how you get these settings right, but it does seem to me pretty powerful if we don't get them right. Uh, and then wonder why we're not perhaps making as much progress as we should in the learning and development and skills process. Is that is that a fair kind of uh, concern? And if it, if it is, what do we? How do we pr approach that? I, I think it is, Martin. Um, can, can I start at a slightly broader level and maybe Please. offer a slightly more positive um, <laughs> view than um, than some of the conversation, which is that I, I would say I, I still see amazing instances of uh, problem solving, innovation, technical capacity in my dealings with uh, public servants in various in various problem domains. Like I, I do think that there is still a lot of really interesting and good practice out there. And a lot of it is really cutting edge. And interestingly, I, I think kind of building on what I was saying before, impresses me particularly because uh, it's in the doing. So, so it's, it's yeah. not just a kind of general abstraction of a tool, but to see it applied in a particular way is amazing. I, I saw on the, on the chat, Thea mentioned uh, some seminars that Hanzog and CPI have done together. Yeah. And, and uh, example after example have come through from speakers and indeed from the chat function in those seminars, which are really fantastic. I think there's then something and so the, the kind of slightly more positive view I was going to put is that it, it's, uh, in my experience, less often, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a definitional piece here, but it, it, it's less often the idea that a public problem solver at a kind of working level in a team is looking at a problem and just doesn't have the tool to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's much more that um, there, there isn't a broader uh incentive structure around that to allow that to flourish and then again connecting to to Thea who's on the call the the idea of getting from isolated pockets of amazing excellence amazing practice to thinking about what that looks like in an organization let alone across a service and I think as a kind of meta reflection for this call particularly given the backgrounds of you know panelists in particular that strikes me as an intensely interesting and difficult conversation for us still mm. in our practice. You know, mm. so there is a conversation around tools and techniques. There's a conversation about craft and practical wisdom, but there's a really, really difficult question about how you can get this sort of balance between you want to encourage uh, individual instances of local leadership in, in this sort of public service sense. Now, local leadership... Mm is in and of itself still distributed and connected to community, but for definitional purposes, you're seeing a team or a particular unit or whatever it is doing amazing things. You actually want them to do amazing things without taking the responsibility that they've got to transform their whole department. There is a yes. real benefit in local experimentation, but there's also then a sense of uh, if you're running an agency, how do you allow local experimentation to flourish with an eye to lifting the performance of the agency as a whole. And, and that's a really, really difficult problem, I think, yeah. because yeah. there are some aspects that require a bit of radical thinking at a local level where you actually just want people to have a bit of a crack 
We hear that yes. all the time in the CPI seminars. You, yes, you've exactly. got to go out and have a crack. You've got to have some license. You've got to be protected to be able to do that. Uh, but it can't be seen as uh, underground or protected and left on the side, right? So there's a permission structure around it that is really mm. important. But with mm. that permission structure is then that sense of how you think about the organisation as a whole. And we've talked, and rightly, uh, mostly about public sector context. This is a this is a experimentation innovation challenge that's well known in private sector contexts, including from your experience, Martin. This this idea of having skunk works or having kind of experimentation where you're kind of looking at business models that might actually break the larger organization's yes. business model and giving them a bit of a go and then thinking about how you get to scale really quickly. Lots of experiments, but scaling some of them is a really interesting innovation challenge. And I know Rod and I have talked in, in the past about how to think about spanning between kind of macro, meso uh, and micro. And that I think as a practice reflection is a really important part of our kind of broader conversation here. Let me take, thank you, that's great. Um, we're gonna switch focus very much and have a wrap up conversation in just a minute, but two more quick, uh, one for Sam and one for Rod. Sam, I mean, in a way, the Public Service Commission in Victoria is all about conditions and incentives, right? You're, you are at the centre of the system for the whole public service. You are the, the agency that has a pan public sector. So I'm interested in your reflections about the extent to which, as a agency, that's partly about setting the right conditions and incentives, whether you feel that's something you can reflect on. There was also a question in the chat specifically you mentioned earlier, a terrific observation about training but you're not trading, but developing people with lived experience to be able to be more kind of engaged and effective. And I know Beth raised some interesting stories about how sometimes the best public service training is not a public service, it's actually about citizens getting into the whole issue of public work and public problem solving. Do you want to just take a very couple of minutes just to give a Victorian sort of PSC focus? Because agency-wise, you do have some levers, I guess, and some ways in which you and Adam and the rest of the team can do some of this um, context and condition setting. Yeah, and I can I can feel myself getting nervous now because I've been with the VPSC for a total of three months, and I feel like my ability that's to heaps, that's all you need. Half, Just give us your answer on three months, and then yeah, don't needs worry about to be it. heavily <laughs> caveated. So okay. my views are my own. Um, Good. All right. Um, Point taken. But no, 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 no. Um, I think I think it's a really interesting role and the opportunity to to play that as a very strong center um, in 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 that broader context and the broader ecosystem is huge across all public sector commissions, I think, and particularly critical at the moment where there are, it's such a uh, dynamic external environment. And, and if I'm gonna be really brutally honest here and Victoria's uh, had this particularly, but I think across the board, you know, we frame public servants and the media perception and the common perception is not good. It's of mm. you know lazy people or fat cats or you know mm -hmm. you know we get we get a lot of the poor um, poor we have got if we were an individual we would be we would have very poor self image. Um, that's yeah, which I think Dan was making earlier. Generally. That's the point. Yeah, yeah and exactly. it is, and I do think that there's a real opportunity. Like you know, you you are what you see yourself reflected as, and I think there's a mm. whole opportunity to actually. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, acknowledge, and this is all of the framing and context, um, yeah. you know, you, you can't be what you can't see. And what we see is, is you know, public sector leaders getting pilloried everywhere for not being as wonderful mm. as everyone else is. Mm. And, um, you know, so the opportunities, I think, to think mm -hmm. about how people learn, how you create that um, positive cycle of influence and, and and it is that top down stuff, but I do believe it is also a lot about that strength based opportunities of highlighting what is working well and that peer to peer learning to say that actually we don't need, we don't just rely on external people telling us how we should be doing things. And I think, you know, Beth yeah. and I have talked a lot about the consultancy world and the extent to which we create multi million dollar industries on that basis. Mm. Like the opportunity is really to start um, making the dialogue around less deficiency based and more around it is happening. Um, and how do we how do we share that? How do we make that visible? And how do we make that a social norm so that if you are not digitally literate, if you are not actually working with community, if you are not doing these things, you're yeah. not being a good public servant. Yeah. Like that's not that's not part of the deal. Your that's, your that's deal is to be contemporary. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. And so I think that's a massive cultural shift because we are we are public administrators and we do lock ourselves into this very bureaucratic approach that isn't always necessary. So I think there's yeah. lots of opportunity yeah. to reframe. Anyway, we're public administrators, <laughs> or are we public, <laughs> yeah. public problem solvers? Yes, this language is a yeah. is an issue, particularly as public administration doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be quite resonating uh, in what in the way that it might have done back in back in the day, as I say. And as you can tell from the color of my hair, that day was you know back in the 1970s. I have to say that it's just disgraceful, but it's true. I'm going to yeah. start wrapping, and I'm going to rapidly ask the um, panel to do one last bit of work for us. It's been a, a really amazing conversation. The chat is extraordinary. Um, James, I just want to make sure, by the way, I know Jesper had to leave the call for a family reason, but let's make sure we capture this chat. I've basically got myself about two weeks' work, I think, out of these two hours, which is really quite frightening, just to get through all these amazing links. So that's great. Um, and I know people are leaving because uh, the, 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 the day, certainly in this part of the world, is now gearing up, so we do need to move on. While we've been talking, I've been uh, inventing a new index, and it's called the Requisite Education Progress Index, otherwise known as REPI. Um, it doesn't exist, obviously, except in my slightly um, weird head. <clears throat> I'm going to ask each member of the panel to, to measure where we are at the moment on the Requisite Education Progress Index. Are we, are we barreling along? Would you give it a really high score? I don't even know what this index has got in it, but you get my point. I'm interested to get your last comments, and I'm going to finish with Beth, and I'm going to start with Rod, and then we'll just go through the rest. So, Beth, you can have the last word. How are we tracking? And to what extent are you feeling reasonably positive about where we need to pick up this pace and intensity? Because I'm hearing all morning or evening or afternoon, wherever we all are, the pace and intensity of this learning game has got to, has got to lift and is lifting to some extent. As you step back, though, in that classic sort of last 10 minutes of a very, very rich conversation, if you were trying to get a handle on where our index is, is it going well? Is it really under the pump? Where would you put it? Rod, why don't I start with you with that slightly unfair question, but just a quick reflection about where would you put so, us at the moment about how we're tracking? Uh, on a seven point scale, I'd put us at about two and a half. Um, seven point scale was exactly what I had in mind, by the way. That's brilliant. Well done. Um, yeah, really that low. Wow. Yeah, that low. Um, and I think in part, um, we're trying to do things bottom up from a lot, a small number of enthusiastic people in a small number of enthusiastic places or institutions or units. Right. right. When what we need is actually something that's much bigger than that. So I'd ask the question why, if we tell students in our school system now that they should have better information about their careers counseling and guidance mm -hmm. and information about prospects for the future. Yeah. And we have in our Melbourne Declaration and our schools declarations that they should be confident, creative, capable thinkers. Citizens. Why is that not an expectation on every single public servant that we should be embracing growth mindsets and open and learning mindsets? Why is it not an expectation of all of our institutions that they should be expansive institutions with those same mindsets? Yeah. And to do that requires a lot more than building on the good things that work bottom up. I think it, yeah. it's a bit of a reframing of how we're going to tackle really hard problems in a world where, remember, our starting point is we face a set of problems that we just have no answer for at the moment, yep. at a level okay. of complexity and scale and scope that we don't okay. have an answer for at the moment. So I, I really. think there's something bigger that is needed. So relatively low score, but a very big vision and a very big room, for that, you know, a big space to fill. Daniel, can I go to you next and see how you would track our index? How are you feeling about the way in which this conversation is moving? Well, I, I think I gave you a sort of a negative answer earlier already on, on this question, but- You're allowed to change your mind, by the way. <laughs> maybe to compliment that, I think one of the, the, the questions I have in my mind is how would we even track this? How would we know what data do we actually want to have to figure out how well we're doing here? And what, what I'm constantly frustrated about is of course, countries often look to us to have some sort of comparative indicators on things that matter. and. And what we find is that when we try to go back to countries to collect this kind of data, to even see, you know, how much training do yeah. people do, how much money are you spending in this? I mean, we know clearly that the first thing that was cut after the 2008 financial crisis around the world was training. For yeah, of course. Um, they never really came back. But then, you know, it kind of came back in different ways. It's not being tracked anymore. Nobody really has numbers mm -hmm. on this. Okay. When we do look at how public servants perceive their training, I think somebody mentioned this in, in some of the surveys that are done. It's usually not great. 
uh, when we when we look at uh, questions around um, around sort of the the ability of the retention of people who have particular skills who come into the public service, it's usually not very good either. So right. the, the few indicators that might exist in, in bits and pieces here and there don't seem to be pointing in the right direction, but it would be great if we could actually develop uh, okay. some more indicators across countries and, and that's something that- There you go. So it sounds like a job well. for the OECD to me, um, but anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Sally, um, how would you track us at the moment? Um, either, with a, either with a New Zealand lens or just more generally? How would you I think a, a general one, actually. I think we're in transition. And so I, I would probably give four and a half out of seven, actually, because I think we're talking about it. I've seen a huge shift in New Zealand, even being out of New Zealand for three years, a huge, especially in things like, um, you know, the relationship between between government and the Tangata Whenua or Māori people, of New, Indigenous people of New Zealand. And I think that's shifting the way we think in lots of different right. ways. And I think we are really thinking about stewardship, collab how we yeah. how we collaborate. And and um, and then, you know, having joined ANZOG, I think eight or nine months ago now, um, you know, I see I see these these this wonderful um, experience in what people are doing, and and I think something like schools of government, like in the same with the OECD, we provide a platform for people to talk about these things, and and that yeah. peer to peer learning happens in our, you know, as much as what we teach, it's what happens in the in the context where people are talking about what they're doing, and same as what we're doing today. So I mean, I don't think five, 10 years ago, we would have been having all of these, I've sat on about three or four webinars in the last couple of weeks. I, I, so yeah. I think we're in transition. So I, I'm, okay. I'm kind of um, pessimistically optimistic. Love it, yeah, yeah, real, real, a realist, but uh, yeah, but, but at least some energy. Chuba, where would you put us? Uh, I am at the more optimistic end of the court. So uh, I, I think maybe five to five and a half. I, I'm still thinking about Daniel's uh, metrics uh, contribution, which could not have been any more on brand. It was so perfect. So I'm trying to think <laughs> about right a, a kind of right version That's of... Uh, totally what we need we from the OECD. That, <laughs> that was so fantastic. Um, look, consistent with what I said before, uh, there are there is real excellence in public service. I look around at what comparator institutions might be doing and mm. uh, look at uh, other contributions to public problem solving, shall I say, uh, yeah. whether it's from yeah from other sectors, whether it's from uh, the private sector or consultants or think tanks or uh, academia. And the ideas that I see that are generated and acted upon in the public service, uh, have real content, have real meaning, and mm. uh, have been tested, particularly over the last 18, 24 months, in a way that have stood up pretty well. Is there yeah. potential to do much better? Absolutely. Uh, in what I was saying before, I am ambitious for doing better in the way that uh, broadly was canvassed across the panel and I couldn't be more supportive of the directions that have been put in the panel. But uh, does that mean that the current system is broken? I don't believe that it's broken. And no. I'd struggle to give a fail mark no. to something that, you know, is not broken. You know, there, there are no. important things to be done. And part of uh, what's also come through in the conversation is the self-image, perhaps, of people working in the public service tends to be quite critical. I think recognising and celebrating success is really yeah. important. And I think uh, that's, again, true in the meta story here, that uh, we need to get better as learning organisations, but there is, a, for an immensely complex, distributed, complicated organisation doing very hard things, yes. uh, it's doing pretty well. It, it can do better, cool. but it's doing pretty yeah. well. Okay. That's excellent. Uh, I'm going to go to Sam now, and then I'm going to give Beth and her rather spectacular cat shadow performance that's going on over there the last word. I must say it's very exciting to watch. Sam, all yours. Just, um, just quickly. Look, I, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give it a three. So I'm I'm up half a point on you, Rod. Um, I think I think I don't think the system's broken. I think we know. I think we know what needs like what people need to know. That's not the challenge. I think it's figuring out how 
to teach it. I think this is an issue around adult learning in a like an operational environment that is yeah. completely prohibitive around learning. So I'm interested in how do we how do we how do we get this in um yeah so that's that's the big I reckon that's the biggest challenge for everything yeah. because the traditional structures and our traditional way that we think about training doesn't work it's why Daniel we don't know what the evidence is it's all around self-perceived learning and you know we all know we're not the best judges of those kind of things sure. so I think that's a sure. massive challenge Thanks. okay there we go Beth after two hours where are we tracking after two hours? Uh, in, in all of your vast experience, are we tracking well? Are we tracking in ways that you feel reasonably positive about in terms of the next two to three well, years? Well, I am relentlessly positive or I wouldn't <laughs> do what I do for a living. And you wouldn't be living I, in New York either, right? And That's any right. of us who work in pub, the, the uh, unfairly maligned public administration have to be relentlessly positive to do what we do. But that said, I would... <laughs> put the metric somewhere around uh, uh, what Rod is saying and Sam, in other words, we're at the very low end of this scale. Um, there are pockets of excellence and we know what works. And COVID has given us a lot of license to do more, uh, to both mm. to understand what works and to do more of it. But that said, in terms of the infrastructure for how we're, how we're doing it, we're not connecting training and learning to policy priorities, you know, it's seen as something truly kind of down there, deep in the administrative side of administration, and not seen as something core to the vision of really achieving key policy priorities, number one. Number two, we're plagued by the bright, shiny object where we're not focusing on how skills help us to solve problems as opposed to learning whatever is the most ideologically interesting thing um, at the moment or where we have our latest obsessions. Um, so we really need to connect those skills. And above all, we need to really measure how learning connects to impact. Um, we're not really measuring what we do, not in terms of seats and chairs or number of people taking courses or whether they like the course or how many hours they spent in the course. But the question is, did they do a better job at serving the public? That's Absolutely. a hard thing to measure and we're not doing a good enough job of it. We haven't had enough time to do it yet. So I'm optimistic right. that we can do more of it. Um, but ultimately that ties then to applying what we've uh, advances that we've developed in learning science um, in other domains, including in private sector and tertiary education and secondary education to really improving how we deliver that learning to ensure that it translates again into improved projects that lead to improvements for real people uh, um, so that we're connecting that through line as opposed to seeing training as a function like finance or accounting or some other yeah. unfortunate byproduct of running an organization rather yeah. than as the most important thing we can do, which is to invest in the people. Indeed. And the, ca and the cats. And the cat who is doing an absolutely spectacular job, as I say, that's almost worthy of some sort of, uh, you know, award, I think. Um, well, for, first of all, and a terrific award too. First of all, I'm just thrilled that we were able to inject a, an index and all of a sudden numbers were being used and we had a whole, you know, we had science in the conversation at last, you know, because two and a half and four and five immediately, um, we've taken the whole thing to another scale. That was terrific. Um, I'm going to end by reading two very quick uh, observations from the chat because it's the best way I can think of wrapping up and thanking everyone. Helen Daniels from Canada, who then had to leave. This has been an incredibly rich conversation. Thank you for sharing yourselves and your work. I felt lonely before I joined in today. Now I know many of you are struggling with similar challenges. And then the quote that Thea added from uh, Kania Kramer and Singy, Transforming a system is really about transforming the relationship between people who make up the system. Simply bringing people into relationship can create huge impact. I would like to suggest that the last two hours has been something of an object lesson in that principle. And it wouldn't have happened without the generosity and the energy and the relatively early morning and the relatively late night for various people on this panel and indeed on this group. And I want to thank them all, all of you very, very much for uh, turning up, uh, which is always 90% of the game, as you know, and then the other 10% is just putting such a lot of uh, energy and intelligence and uh, thoughtfulness into the conversation. We are going to leave it there. As I say, um, I've picked up about at least two weeks worth of homework out of the chat room. So thank you for all of that. Uh, I've got more links to follow up than I can, uh, I can poke a stick at. Uh, lots and lots of things to um, talk about. States of change, terrifically valuable forum, I think, and I hope as this festival moves on, we can take it from there.
Um, for the moment, I think we're going to say a, a warm goodbye to everybody and we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks so much, everybody. See you later.